If you clicked on this video, it's because you want to know if Ikem Ikuanu is a good tackle prospect. And yes, obviously he is. Th that's all, folks. But the real question that you should be asking is where does he fit best? At tackle or at guard? It is a much more nuanced conversation than you think, full of little technical details and scheme-related questions, but it is a conversation worth having. And no, I am not saying that Aquanu cannot play tackle or cannot play guard. In fact, it's quite the opposite, and I think that he would be very good at either spot. It's more so just a discussion about which position he should play in certain offenses, which is a big difference in topic. So with that all being said, let's dive into it. And by the way, this week's recipe is a wonderful cherry sidecar because I do not have three months lead time to make a proper cherry bounce for all the North Carolina people watching this. Apparently when people from that state drink, they don't mess around and they take a long time to make their favorite drink. So I did a cherry sidecar instead. Came out pretty damn good if I do say so myself. So uh, go grab yourself a glass of something, whatever you got lying around, and uh, let's get into the strengths of Aquanu as a prospect. Watching Aquanu on tape, the first thing that stands out is obviously his athleticism and how he weaponizes that athleticism as a run blocker. In particular, I think that teams that run a lot of outside zone concepts are going to love Aquanu as a tackle because he's actually athletic enough to widen out edge defenders or just outright bulldoze them in order to open up lanes on the front side of the concept. Most tackles are just not quick enough to get into position to do that on outside zone, so they'll just resort to kicking out the edge and hoping for the best while the running back is forced to cut back up the field early, but Aquanu is different. He can actually win to the front side. There's a play from the South Florida game that comes to mind where they ran outside zone from the pistol, and you can see just how dominant Aquanu is to drive his man off the ball on the front side in order to open up that lane to the edge, which again is a rarity for this type of run. You need a special athlete at tackle in order to make that happen, and Aquanu is that special athlete. Let's look at the end zone angle of this play because I want to point out exactly what he does from a technique perspective in order to open this up. His first step is what offensive line coaches call a bucket step, which is roughly four to six inches back and to the side at a 45 degree angle. And coaches love opening up with bucket steps on zone runs because of the benefits of so-called losing ground in order to gain ground. You want that first step back and losing ground vertically so that you're not immediately getting engaged by the defender and you have slightly more space to gain ground laterally with your second and third steps. By the time Aquanu's third step is in the ground, he's in a very balanced position with better lateral leverage to take on contact from the defender, and once he does take that contact, watch his hips and feet specifically. He is torquing his whole body back inside and flipping the direction of his hips from the outside to the inside while trying to grab and control that defender and also throw him back to the inside. If done correctly, this little torque and seal on contact can effectively wall off the entire first level of the defense and open up that front side lane to the edge immediately. Now, to the defender's credit, he does a good job of fending off Aquanu's hands at first here and trying to fight back over the top of the block to get in position back outside, which is exactly what he's supposed to be doing. But as the defender does that, I want you to notice how Aquanu refits his hands back inside the defender's frame for round two. He gets one hand on the defender's outside shoulder, but more importantly, he refits his inside hand underneath the defender's inside armpit, which then allows him to use the edge's momentum against him to literally just throw him to the ground. And by the way, no, that is not a holding penalty because the defender was already going that direction and there were no jersey tugs outside of the frame. Iquanu just literally tossed a grown man because he is that strong. 46 yards later, we have ourselves a touchdown. How about on the backside of zone runs though? Because obviously whatever offense he's in is not just going to only run outside zone in one direction. How does he look when the play is going away from him and he is the one responsible for creating the cutback lane? Well, as you might imagine, he's pretty damn good at that too. Let's look at this play against Louisiana Tech, which was once again an outside zone call, this time from the shotgun instead of the pistol. And the difficulty of this block might be a little bit tough to understand at first if you're not familiar with outside zone blocking rules. So let's just break down the whole concept from start to finish just to kind of give you some context here. 
LaTeX is in a five-man surface on the line of scrimmage with a three technique to the side of the running back. And a lot of coaches would consider this ostensibly an under front because of that. And in order to run outside zone against an under front, and specifically an under front where you have edge defenders declaring well before the ball is snapped that they're lining up way to the outside in order to box everything in, in order to make this kind of call work against this kind of front, the entire success of the play relies on this backside tackle, which is Aquano. Let's go through this play step by step and I'll explain why. This H-back and the right tackle on the front side are just kicking out these two dudes all day long. They know that they cannot seal them out and create a lane to the edge from this alignment, so they're just going to widen them to the best of their abilities and give everyone else some more room to work. Meanwhile, this uncovered guard on the front side is going to look first to the tackle's inside shoulder in order to protect him against that edge defender potentially slanting inside. And if the edge does not slant inside, he'll then climb up to the second level in order to get on the front side safety. Now, when it comes to the center, because it is outside zone, his responsibility is going to be the mic linebacker. In most outside zone calls, the center will be on the mic, but in order to do that, he has to execute a perfect scoop block first along with this backside guard in order to combo on the nose tackle and get up to that mic. And that means that he needs to take that same bucket step we talked about earlier. He needs to win to the front side shoulder of the nose tackle, knock him back just enough in order to give that backside guard some space to take over the block, and then he can start to climb up to the mic. That is scoop block 101 really quickly for all of you. Obviously, there's a lot more to it from a technical side, but that's an episode for another day. All you really need to know for now is this center has to get to the mic, and because of that, this backside guard cannot help Aquanu at all when it comes to reach blocking the three technique because he has to get out right now and go take over the block on the nose from two gaps over. And all of that, again, then brings us back to the difficulty of this backside reach block from Aquanu. The whole concept relies on it because they know that they have to create a cutback lane. The defense is aligned in such a way that winning to the front side is a virtual impossibility, and that cutback lane is most likely going to have to be between the three technique and the nose tackle because the backside edge is not even being blocked anyway. This A-gap right here is where that crease needs to be created. As the ball is snapped, again, you can see Aquanu leading with that bucket step, He's losing ground to gain ground, and he has to haul ass here because the three technique has a natural alignment advantage because he was already lined up so far inside of Aquanu's stance. He has a lot of ground that he has to make up with these first few steps, and by God, because he is such a ridiculous athlete, he does make up that ground, and he does get to the front side of that three technique in order to start to create a seal. Now, what's interesting about his technique and the whole reason why I wanted to highlight this play in the first place is how he goes about sealing this lane. As he wins to the front side, you can see that he is concerned about the three technique potentially doing what's called backdooring the block and just kind of shooting underneath him. So he throws out his arm to feel for that adjustment and then he slams on the brakes and literally boxes out the three tech as if he's a post-up player in basketball. That little bit of a seal was all that was needed in order to open up that desired cutback lane, and the running back once again took it for a long touchdown run. And by the way, this was not the only time that Aquanu ever did that, or at least anything similar to it, and this style of backside cutoff is literally something that he practices because he is just so damn athletic that he can get away with it, while 85 to 90% of other tackles probably could not. He is truly a tremendous athlete with length and strength and incredible straight line speed that shows up in virtually everything he does. Whether he is absolutely caving in a four eye on a counter run in order to create a massive pile up and widen the point of attack, or if he's pulling out in space as a lead blocker for all of NC State's edge run game shenanigans that they love to call so much, to even just basic pass protection where he's got quick feet and explosive redirection ability that shows up constantly. I mean, this dude is just different physically than most tackles. He can do things that a lot of other guys just can't, which is why ultimately he might be the first offensive lineman off the board. Now, that all being said, it doesn't mean that he's a perfect prospect. Primarily, in my opinion, when it comes to pass protection, he can get almost too aggressive at times, and he'll get way over his toes just trying to make contact and shocking the rusher off of their path. He also tends to come in really high with his inside hand rather than hooking up and under the rusher's arm to get into his chest, and when you combine high hands with leaning too far forward and over aggression, it can lead to some really bad results. 
Most notably in the Florida State game, their edge rushers kind of figured him out early on in that game, and they beat him multiple times with spin moves and push-pull moves, because again, he was leaning way too far over his toes so he couldn't recover, and his punch was way too high so he couldn't catch their rib cage to the inside and keep them from spinning off of his punch. He's very lucky that one of the times he got beat, it was blown dead for a false start instead of leading to a very, very big sack. But Jermaine Johnson got him again later in that game, that time on an outside spin move, once again because of that same overaggression and spotty hand placement. It also showed up a little bit in the run game in that matchup as well, where he got taken advantage of multiple times by the whole FSU edge group because he just kept leaning way too much so they were easily able to stack and shed on his blocks by kind of exploiting his issues with balance. Again, this problem is not a deal breaker for me, and overall, he still was a good pass protector, even though he's not a fully day one NFL ready pass protector, in my opinion. But I would not be doing my job if I didn't point out this issue with his game, because it is absolutely something that needs to be fixed before he starts games against the likes of TJ Watt or Miles Garrett or literally any AFC West team. To me, it just comes down to needing more coaching and refinement than just pure lack of ability. And if he goes to the right coach that can maximize his gifts, he'll probably be just fine. All right, so there are some of the strengths to Iquanu's game as a prospect, as well as some of the, I don't really want to call them weaknesses because he doesn't really have any weaknesses. More so, like I said, just kind of technical things he needs to clean up but the conversation should still be had about what position he fits best. Where does that skill set translate to, whether it be tackle or guard? And I have a rather lengthy answer to that question, and as I've alluded to several times, there's a lot of layers to it, a lot of nuance to it, because it does kind of factor in where he goes in the draft. But before I get to that answer and kind of explain what I mean by that, I do want to take a moment to thank our sponsor for this week that helped to make this show possible in the first place, Roman. The vast majority of people that watch my channel are men, so Roman wanted to take the opportunity today to remind you all that the human body is a very complex machine, and it requires a very delicate balance of nutrients to work properly and stay healthy. I myself am almost 31 now, and as we get older, as some of you I'm sure have experienced as well, it does get a lot harder to maintain the same energy levels and fat distribution, and even bone density that we did when we were young and seemingly invincible. So for those of us that want a little help with any of that through supplements or medical treatments, Roman is here for us. Whether it's hair loss treatment, eczema treatment, testosterone levels, ED, or even prostate health and support in quitting smoking, Roman has the resources and products available for men to help with almost any issue they might have in their day-to-day -day health and wellness. If you just wake up one day and you don't feel quite right, you can go to GetRoman.com and just check out what they have to offer. They might be able to help with whatever your problem happens to be. And remember, with that link, you also get $15 off your membership. Again, that is GetRoman.com slash FilmRoom. Just see what they can do for you, because if you have a problem, they might be able to help. Thank you again to Roman for sponsoring today's show. And with that, let's get back to it. When it comes to what position Equanu should play, it depends on the type of offense you want to run. If you're a predominantly outside zone run game where you need your tackles to be athletic enough to seal that front side lane against a six technique, or at worst just beat the shit out of them to widen that edge and make everyone on the interior line's jobs a little bit easier, Equanu should be the tackle for you. He is ready made to do that right now. In addition to that, if you also play in a division where they run a lot of three down fronts, or you see a lot of head up five techniques, or four eyes if they're doing a whole bunch of tight front stuff, or double G's in four down fronts, anything of that nature, and if your answer for that as an offense is to just run counter or going old school and running wing T stuff like belly all fucking day until they get out of those fronts, Iquanu is also going to be your guy because he is so powerful that he can just completely wash down the defensive line and make it easier for all of those pullers to get to their targets. NC State did that basically every single week just because they could. However, if your run game is primarily gap based or if you run a lot of power or trap, or if you just have unathletic guards that can't really move in space, 
Ekwanu would be an excellent option for those teams because he is a really tremendous puller and down blocker. Again, like I said, he's got the power to move people out of the way and create space for a puller to work behind him, but it's when he is the one out in space and mowing down DBs, that's the film that really makes me think that he can be an amazing asset as a guard in a power-heavy run scheme that gets him on the move. Not to mention, he can still do all of the zone stuff for you as a guard too, it would just be less of a starring role, so to speak. Also, in terms of pass protection, depending on the type of offense and how much 5-0 protection they like to use in the drop back passing game, with no running backs and no tight ends helping out, and yes, I'm looking at you, New York Giants, it might be beneficial to Aquano's career to start him out at guard in that type of offense until he kind of refines his hands a little bit. If he has little to no chip help when he's going against these all-pro edge rushers that have a runway to work with and they could kind of influence him to lean whatever direction they want him to, I just don't think he's quite ready to handle that right now. And let's be honest, some coaches just don't like to sacrifice their tight ends and running backs to the protection gods and they want to run 5-0 as much as they can, so it just kind of is what it is. He can still absolutely get there and make progress quickly to the point where we totally forget about his issues and he can be left on an island all day long, just like Tristan Wirfs did pretty much immediately once he got to the pros. But not everybody can be Tristan Wirfs, you know? That is a very tall order to match. So for those types of teams that just want to be pedal to the metal in the passing game with five guys out in the route as much as they can, starting him first at guard just to kind of ease him into things a little bit and then kicking him out to tackle later when he's ready, I just think that that type of move could be really good for all parties involved. So there you have it. That is Ikem Aquanu in a nutshell. You could argue that he is one of the very best players in this class because he is so scheme diverse. And he's also one of the very few people that I think fits literally all 32 teams. It's kind of like Elton Jenkins for the Packers. If you need him to play tackle, he can play tackle. If you need him to play guard, he can play guard. He could probably still be a pretty badass center as well if you taught him to, you know, snap and get out of a stance quickly. I do think that he could fit pretty much anywhere as long as he's in the right system. And when it comes down to it, that is kind of the key to longevity in this league because the more you can do, the more positions you can play, and the, let's just say, highest floor that you can possibly have is usually what's going to determine how long you're in the league. And at least in my opinion, Ikem Ikwanu is going to be in the league for a very long time. So that'll do it for this week's episode. Again, if you're so inclined and you're into that sort of thing, go make yourself a cherry sidecar. Recipe is down in the comments below or shortly following me here. I got some little drink B-roll for you that you guys love so much. And uh, also remember for your Patreon member, go vote on the Patreon for the next topic. We're kind of getting into prospect ranking season now. So, you know, those hour long specials that you remember from last year. And then we got the mock draft special coming out. So, uh, yeah, a lot of stuff still to come here uh, on draft season. Thank you all for watching. I'll see you very soon. And until next week, cheers. Cheers.